Paul writes to this apostle, Titus, who's been left behind on Crete in order to strengthen Titus in appointing elders on that wayward and dissolute island. The culture of society has got into the churches there. They're lawless, they're liars, they're badly behaved, they're a mess. Yeah? And the answer to that is you need the Bible in there. Because God uses the Bible to, to create, formulate human character. In tension with human experience, truth comes in and there's this sort of creative tension that goes on. We have things happen in our lives. If things don't happen in your life, you never grow in grace, right? That's true, isn't it? It says that in the Bible, actually. Yeah? So when things happen to us, we go to the Bible with our questions. We go to our God with our questions, and he speaks through his word, and he, he changes us about. Now, that happens very clearly, but, and then in the normal course of events, we sit here on Sunday mornings, and I sort of go on for a bit about the Bible, and things get put into our hearts and minds, and that, almost imperceptibly sometimes, changes our, perceptive, our perceptions, it changes our characters and forms our thinking. It's like discipline and training. You do it until it becomes instinctive. You hear it until it becomes instinctive. And then you go and practice that. And one day, you'll find yourself making responses and so on that you may or may not attribute to something you heard previously, but character has been formed under the influence of the Spirit as the Word goes forward. And that's why teaching ministry in churches is really, really important to those churches. People come and visit us when they come... We don't do this too often because it doesn't often go very well. But when people do come and visit us, they come and they think they've got to bring John 3.16 because it's a church plant. Yeah? And anything like that. People are one to Christ as the word of God is taught to them and as they're brought in to an understanding of the things of God and until they're given a worldview, a whole vision of things, and there comes a point where we need to say John 3.16. They do something about it. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Paul is therefore erecting on Crete a teaching ministry. Because that's what the church there needs to, to remake it, to reformulate it, to take the world out of the church and make the church more the kingdom of God. Making sense? Everybody happy? Nobody's throwing cushions. It's good so far. There are many rebellious people there in the churches on Crete doing just what the culture they come from would lead them to do. Get elders in there. Says Paul. Into that context without elders have come people teaching them about all sorts of Jewish myths and rules of man-made religion alongside the rampant and renowned lying and immorality that characterise this island race of Cretans. So there's this Jewish rules and regulations and myths scenario being added on to the Bible main course. Sickening the stomachs of those people, diverting them away from the way. And that's affecting them. That's affecting their lives, their behaviour, their experience of life and so on. So at the back of all he's saying here lies Paul's powerful conviction of the impossibility of the legalism in Judaism putting any sinful human being right with God. They're getting all these extras added on and it's impossible to get right with God that way. They're bringing all this asceticism, all these rules and regulations, all this being nasty to yourself in as if being nasty to yourself is going to make you holy. It's working with God that's going to, walking with God that's going to make you holy, says Paul. It is impossible for legalism in Judaism to put any sinful human being right with God or enable any Christian person to walk with God more closely. So when people come along to you with add-ons, send them away. When people come to you with a fascination with myths about angels, and it happens, it happens on my Facebook pages. Christians getting so taken up with angels or, or, or Israel or some weird speculation about the future. Send them away because it is of no use and it doesn't, it doesn't help you because it sort of detracts from the getting right with God stuff. That's been happening on Crete, all these Jewish myths and all these extra rules and regulations. And Paul spells out in Romans 1 to 3, it's a load of rubbish. It doesn't help. And in Philippians 3, Paul sums up his own rejection of Judaism's rule-based religion. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake, whose sake I've endured the loss of all things. I consider them not helpful, not interesting. They're rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing him. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. 
So when rubbish springs up in my life, I trust him. When things get thrown across my path, I turn to him. I trust him. This is faith, isn't it? You know, we've got, I suppose we're victims of um, 20th century middle class intellectual Christianity, which has been great, but, but this isn't an intellectual thing purely. It, it's a matter of knowing propositions. It's a matter of knowing truth. But actually it's a matter of when things are thrown across my path, I know those truths and I rely on them and I rely on him for them. Yeah? Is that making sense? I think it's probably making a lot of sense, which is why you're not trying not to nod too much, because in a small gathering it'll show you up. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? That's faith, isn't it? It's trusting him. With this that's happened again, that I don't like. Galatians 2, similarly. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. So these people with the rules and the regulations, and you've got to perform, and you've got to do this, and you've got to be up to scratch, and da-da-da, rubbish. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. May God dignify our lives this week with being able to, to, for people to see that we're living our life by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we want to persuade people of Christ, there's how you persuade people of Christ, isn't it? The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. And so much of the sort of highfalutin teachings and the new ideas and the fascinating stuff and the stuff that people in churches get so sucked up in is a laying aside the grace of God. Let's concentrate on that. That's not what's happening on Crete. And that needs to be reasserted. I do not set aside the grace of God for, here's the reason, if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Period. Religion, religiosity, sets aside the grace of God in Paul's theology. So today we see Paul dealing with another example of that happening. As it happens, it's happening on Crete, apparently, as often, in the teeth of rules-based righteousness, in inverted commas, being peddled and sold as a higher form of Christian living. These ideas don't come to you as, look, you know, here's, here's, a, here's a debasement of Christianity. They come and say, this is the proper way, this is the right way, this is the way to be a, a five-star Christian. And Paul's saying, actually, rules and regulations in religion do not increase purity. They remove it. They remove it. So Paul starts <coughs> with a look at the people who are actually pure, righteous in the eyes of God. And he doesn't do much about this because he's going to deal with the, the other thing, you see. But he's mainly focusing on what, what is impure um, to elucidate what is pure, righteous in the eyes of God. You need to notice from the outset he deals um, the pure no more than a glancing blow. He's defining that which is pure by contrast with that which is not. The, the but is where it's all going to. See, the, to the pure all things are pure, but it's the but is where it's all headed. Because it's the but they've got on Crete. But uh, it elucidates the point. What does Paul mean by pure? The word that's used is katharos. Uh, he uses it three times in the verse, twice in the first clause in the verse. He's pure, pure, pure. Paul's mind is running on the Cretan heretics teaching about asceticism. They're saying, if you want to be pure, you've got to afflict your body, you've got to whip yourself and wear chains and all that, I don't know. What do they get up to? All that historical stuff before the Reformation. You know, it happens still, actually. It happens in our universities still. I was absolutely shocked as an undergraduate to discover that somebody I thought was a very nice sort of person, Roman Catholic, was involved in all sorts of stuff with a particular Catholic um, sect, and, and it was really physically... What? Unbelievable causing yourself pain or hardship to try and make yourself more pure. Paul says that doesn't work, that does the opposite, has the opposite effect. And he's using a word here against these heretics uh, that has the sense of both ceremonial and of moral purity, in both senses in, in the same verse. So he uses it in terms of moral and in terms of cultic then, uh, you know, in the, in the rituals and stuff, purity, in the same verse. Cut a long story short, these heretics are teaching uh, that this and that make a person ritually unclean and that the rules must be kept for ritual purity to please God. And Paul's response goes like this. He says, all things are ritually clean to the morally clean. He's using the word in two different ways in the same sentence to make a point, you see. All things are ritually clean to the 
morally clean. You've been put right with God, therefore you are morally clean. Does that make sense of it? To appear all things appear. Okay, if we've got that, I won't make any more of it. I'll just say, remember Peter and the sheep and heaven in Acts chapter 10? Don't call unclean what God has made clean. I've had this through the Farmers UK Twitter account in the last week or 10 days. Yeah. I, I get a bit fed up with people who try to be you know, moralistic about this issue. Act 10, Peter's told to rise and kill and eat the ritually unclean things he sees let down in the sheep from heaven. Go for it. And Paul's Judaizing opponents would teach that a morally pure person is made unclean by eating unclean foods or touching some unclean thing. You've been dealing that in 1, 1 Timothy 4 for, for believers in Ephesus. The same topic raised here again for Titus's sake. Listen, all things are ritually clean for those who are morally clean. So who are those who are pure? Who are the pure? Paul doesn't say. But he contrasts those who are pure with those who don't believe. Is that making sense? Are you, are you with that line of thought? He's saying to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who don't believe. So the contrast with what is pure is those who don't believe. What's the opposite of those who don't believe? No, that's that. that, that <laughs> believers, yeah. Hang on. You can't do that to me today because I'm a little bit tired and I'll panic, <laughs> right? I'll, I'll kind of panic and think, I got that the wrong way around. No, I didn't. I got it right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just for once. <laughs> yeah. So the opposite is that, right? So those who are the pure, what are they? How do you, how do you determine those who are the pure? They are those who believe. They are those who trust God. Now there's a bit of a shocker, isn't it? That's, that's completely countercultural, isn't it? Those who trust in Christ are those who are the morally pure because the death, the price, the penalty of their sin has been paid by one who was utterly, absolutely holy. The pure are those who believe. And for those who are uh, morally clean, believing, all things are ritually clean. I sometimes think of this sort of thing when I go into a place and I'm, I'm being offered cups of tea. Not with any of you, but, but with those that I work with from time to time. And you, you give them a mug and you see the mug and you know that thing is innocent of soap for some long time, yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoops, a daisy, this is going to be good. Lord, thanks very much. <laughs> Please keep this clean. You know, I haven't been really in a lot of trouble yet, ever. He's always looked after me. But, but you know the sort of experience, right? Paul is saying that which makes you ritually clean is having been put right with God, cleaned by the blood of Christ at the cross. The impure are described as those who do not believe because they've just been left alone as they were, as we all were, before we came to Christ. They're left as they were. More on that coming in a minute. Do you remember that verse in John's Gospel? Uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, and Jesus says eventually he says having spoken for a while he says the work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent to trust the one he sent that's the work of God okay to the pure all things are pure all things what things are pure sure arsenic adultery Archaeology, that always strikes me as a mucky job archaeology you go into a trench and you dig a hole with a toothbrush that has got to be a mucky job hasn't it you know, I do some mucky jobs in the course of a week around the farm. I've been done, doing a few this week. I was about to go out yesterday to watch Caris's play, and Helen said, ah, back of your trousers. And, you know, where I just sort of obviously squatted down somewhere to do something, the boots had hit the back of the trousers, and, you know, things happen. I do some mucky jobs, but archaeology, you're doing that all day in a hole with a toothbrush. That's crazy. Is that clean? Is that pure? No. This all things comes in a context, a context of commanding people to abstain from certain foods, engage in certain rituals, possibly uh, forbidding people to marry, and so on, and so on, and so on. All this stuff. It's not the idea. It's not in the ballpark for a consideration of what makes pure. Jesus has this issue with um, his disciples eating food that hands with hands that were, as far as the Jewish leaders were concerned, defiled hands. They hadn't been washed according to the rituals. And the Pharisees come along and they object. And they say, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? How can you possibly wow. Right, okay, you can see that going on, can't you? And he says, as I was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, 
these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, you're dealing with the externalities. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. These are the things that are occurring on Crete. This is what's happening there. And, you know, elders need to be put in place to teach the people otherwise. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human tradition, says Jesus. And he gives an example of the way that they lay aside God's command. And then verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Act, uh, Mark 7, 14. Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. That, that's a really important evangelistic text, isn't it? In our day and age, in our culture and society, where, you know, you go into the supermarket and you try and buy a bottle of water. It's a bottle of water. Pure. It's not. Because you turn it over and on the back there's this list of things it's got in it. But you, don't, you read that, you don't really want to drink. What? what? Or you, 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 buy, um, you buy some orange juice, or you buy, you know, pure. Pure? It's not. It's, 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 it's sort of 80% water or something. It's been watered down in the factory when they put it in that plastic packet or whatever it is. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what's come out of a person that defiles them. You're looking at the wrong sort of stuff. You're looking at the stuff that doesn't and saying it does, says Paul. To the pure, therefore, all things are pure. That's kind of liberating, isn't it? You like my graphic? Amazing what you can find on the internet. To us, all things are pure. If we're in Christ, if we've trusted Christ and he's put us right. But to those, verse 15, he now moves on to deal with the impure, verse 15b, for those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. Nothing is pure. Why is that? Because of the minds they're dealing with everything with. And those minds and consciences are corrupted. Both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. So anything they touch, handle and deal with is corrupted in the process. Did you get that or should I say it again? Did you get that? <clears throat> if you pick up a food item in order to process it, I'm just get an illustration I've invented from looking at you. If I pick up something like a food item to process it and I've got dirty gloves on, that's contaminated because I'm handling it with, or if I'm just doing this with dirty hands, I haven't washed. So you pick up anything with a mind that hasn't been kept clean or been cleaned and you contaminate the process. Nothing is pure. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Paul is not looking to build consensus here. He's stating truth. He is summarizing that over against people who are saying that certain foods, certain rituals, certain things God has said are okay, well, they are not okay. person is not justified by keeping the law but by grace through faith alone and you, you mess with that at your peril look at the effect that will have on you ritual purity washing the outside of the cup has got no effect on inner purity the sort that God looks for at the judgment and turning from sin to follow Christ does impact all areas of the righteousness scenario to the pure all things are pure but to those who are corrupted and do not believe they're saying they believe these people are in church on Sunday but they're adding and Paul is saying they're not trusting they're not trusting to what God says you've got to trust to they're trying to add to it because they don't think that's enough you see and that's not trusting They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. So about the temple gong, it tells me something arrived on my phone. <laughs> there are basically four things going on in this verse. This is plainly where Paul puts his emphasis. It's understandable. This is the problem in Crete. This is the problem that gives rise to the letter. Paul's going to major on it. Nothing they do is pure for those who do not believe, and they are therefore still corrupted in their sin. 
The minds and consciences of these are corrupted, and we'll see how relevant that is in our, con con uh, our contemporary situation as well. They therefore fail the acid test of faith, which is that it engenders the actions that are in accord with sound faith. More about that in chapter 2 next week. And the verdict against such pretend believers is made very plain. Very plain. Unbelievers, nothing is pure. To those who are corrupted do not believe, nothing is pure. Complete moral purity comes not from working at some rule book, but by transfer from a trusted in Jesus. Complete moral purity comes not from working at the rule books, but by transfer from a trusted in Jesus, who transfers that to your account. So all this effort with rules and regulations of religion renders no purity in God's sight at all. I never really quote you hymns, do I? Do I? Not really. I have to work at it. I love hymns, but I, these days I've just got out, out of that and because that's what our society has done. Here's an old hymn. Now all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, the heavenly Lamb, takes all our sin away. A sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. But the imprint of this impurity clings to those who don't believe. To those who are corrupted and do not believe nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. See this guy here with the t-shirt on. Um, he's got on his back I-M-P-U-R-E. Right? And the I-M is in grey and the P-U-R-E is in white. Yeah? Impure. But, but wouldn't it be great if you could just put an apostrophe between the I and the M? I don't know if that was what they thought of when they did the t-shirt, but I found the graphic and I thought, that's interesting. What's the difference between impure and I'm pure. Christ is the difference between those two things. And whatever messes we make as a Christian, and all the things we get into, we have to go back and sort out and apologise and repent and all the rest of it. We're not still in that situation of those who are corrupted and do not believe, where nothing is pure. By the grace of God, here's an amazing thing the Gospel has done intervene in that situation. We were in this situation, minds and consciences corrupted and the grace of God has stepped in. What's the extent of the impurity? Their minds are corrupted by living where we were living, by continuing to live in sin. It corrupts your mind. And if your mind is corrupted, me, I know it's, it means defiled, it means spoiled by impurity, it means putting something in, unclean into something that was clean and messing it up, you know, running right through it. You end up with a dirty mind, a contaminated mind. The way you think is affected by what you believe or don't believe. Their minds, their thinking, their responding, their speaking, their acting have become, from God's perspective, defiled. It is their minds where the trouble lies. It starts with the mind, and of course, because of the way you think, it then moves to the conscience. Have we seen this? Here's the effect of this, it, this corrupted mind. It ends up with a corrupted conscience. You look at our society, what do you see? Unbelief leaves you in sin. Repentance is foreign to you, so the Holy Spirit hasn't cleaned up your thinking. It remains defiled, and Paul is writing to people sitting in church religious people. And that defiled thinking affects the outcome of moral thought. Consciences are accordingly defiled. You know, corrupted conscience is it... I'm going to read you a sentence I wrote here in the early hours of the morning. Ready? Listen, listen to this. This is a cracker. Corrupted conscience is a completely contemporary conundrum. Why? What possessed me to write a stupid sentence like that? But, but look, here's, here's the issue, isn't it? Our society says that that which is wrong is right. In fact, there's a moral goal or a moral absolute. That's where our society has got to. It's not just the thinking that's corrupted. Because the thinking is corrupted, the conscience has been contaminated too. So, and this is just one example, it's picking on one man, and I shouldn't, but he's in the public eye and he's done this very publicly. How is it that a prime minister can appear in the media insisting that they're going to invent gay marriage, in inverted commas? 
and then say that he's doing it and forcing its acceptance by registrars and by Christian people in society at large, whether they're running B&Bs or whatever, against many more enlightened consciences, on the basis that this complete innovation is absolutely the right thing to do. I'm doing this because it is right. Now, I've just picked up one example, and that's unfair, because there are so many. It is right. It, no, it's wrong. But your thinking is up the creek. You do not need a degree in biology to know that. It may be the popular thing to do. It wasn't in, in that case, but it might have been. It may be the thing that for reasons of your own, your own temptations and expressions of your sinful human nature, you passionately want to do. But to say it's the right thing to do is to air a conscience that's been corrupted. And that isn't listening even to utilitarian non-Christian or evolutionary non-Christian or any other number of non-Christian arguments against this either. It's right. Are you sure? The fact is that when you don't trust in Christ, you do what you want to do on the basis of what suits yourself and yourself lives in your corrupt mind so your conscience just incorporates corruptedness. And Paul is talking to religious people. If religious people do not believe in the sense trust wholly in Christ, expect their minds, their patterns of thought and therefore their consciences to become as completely corrupted as that and expect there to be vicars on your radio and on your television promoting all sorts of things that should not be promoted. Expect that, that's what we've got. talking about people who are sitting and standing and speaking for churches and this is where remaining in religious rebellion against the God who calls us to just trust him where sitting in the corruption of mind and conscience is therefore inevitably going to lead you we've got that we can see it it's out there they claim to know God but the effect of their impurity, their actual impurity, is they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. Why is it that we have got such a thorough um, talking down of Christ, of Christianity, of, of everything that the Church of God biblically should stand for? Why is it? Because out there we've got such high-profile examples of those who claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. That, 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 that's that's Landelo. That's all the villages we work in. It's across this land. They've added, they've messed, they've fiddled with essential issues. They are not trusting Christ and therefore their minds, their consciences are corrupted and publicly so. And the effect of that is that there are these people out there who are signposts away from the gospel who claim to know God but by their actions they deny him. Paul says we need to discuss with them and make an agreement. Uh, Paul says we need to have inter-church inter dialogue. He doesn't. He says these people are a set of things that are really quite rude. Quite rude. These people are detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. Can you imagine him turning up at some cathedral somewhere or some, some dead chapel in the middle of somewhere? Can you imagine? Well, he'd, he'd let it rip, wouldn't he? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be with him. I wouldn't trust him to be with him on the day, you know. Some of you mates, you know, not to go into certain situations with because they ain't going to be good. Paul, would, he'd let it fly, wouldn't he? Seeing what we see. The acid test of the reality of grace is where it leads and does it lead to the obedience that comes from faith without, without it there's no assurance sound doctrine has been taken on board has been apprehended has been absorbed there's only this hypocritical claim as he describes it to know God which is denied by the actions of the claimant this is what makes it important and difficult to tackle these folks. They lay claim to the Christian's experience. But they bring it into shame and disgrace. 
And without the Bible teaching ministry of those elders in those churches on Crete there, and, and here, there is no hope for remedying that situation. In the world of what's real, in their actions, not their words, in their actions, they deny the one they claim to know. And these are the windbags from last week. It's all in the videos. Who are sitting in the congregation, leading it and teaching it week after week after week on Crete. And is Wales any different? Yeah, they claim to knowing God, but by their actions they deny Him. And that leaves them in a very tight corner. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. Budiluctos, detestable. Apathes, disobedient. And for every good work, adokimoi, unfit. Good works are the key point here. Remember uh, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10? Um, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves, the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Yeah? For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do what Paul says here, to do those good works that he's prepared for us to walk in. Yeah? The point, the designed in fruit of the gospel, isn't by any means evident in these people, and judgment is reserved for everything unclean. <coughs> Quick conclusion, because I wanted to finish about three minutes ago. Faith is the key to it. Is that trusting him? That actual trusting him? Many lay claim to that faith. Many lay claim to trust him. But carry minds and consciences that are corrupted and devoid of any real world evidence that they've been reconciled to God. So therefore they deny by their actions the very faith they verbally profess. And it isn't just on Christ. It happens here in Llandilo. They're on your Facebook page and mine, if you have a Facebook page or wherever you have. Noisy, noisy. Christian in inverted commas. Chasing all sorts of issues and things that are not trusting Christ for salvation. And we'll be seeing next time what amounts to that which is consistent with, that which is in accord with sound doctrine that these elders on Crete need desperately to teach. And we've done some work on seeing why that is going to be so important. God give us lives lived according to that which is in accord with the sound doctrine we believe. Yeah? God give us grace to trust him in reality in the coming week.